This morning, I want to get right into the Word and just jump into the Word today. We talked the last two weeks about um, uh, really fathers or men and uh, really talking to men. And uh, I I felt like I just wanted to just add one more little thing um, and kind of continue on our series that I actually did a small series in the spring called Father Filled Homes. And just wanted to add to that today before we really move on. And I feel like um, as we get close to the holidays, obviously our hearts get, you know, positioned for the holidays and stuff. And so uh, we're excited about in November, there's two good things happening, a bunch of stuff's happening, but two good things. And the 17th on Sunday morning right here, Andy Elms will be with us from England, a great friend of ours, dear brother, and uh, an amazing, amazing preacher. And so he'll be with us the 17th. And then the following week, the 24th, will be um, what we call our Vision Sunday. That's when we kick off our uh, year-end offering and goes to the whole month of December and just really um, where we've been this last year, where we're going, and and how we can give to what the Lord is going to be doing in 2025. You know, that sounds a little uh, weird saying that, but how many know it's right there? We're, we're kind of getting into 2025, so uh, we're looking forward to those things. If you turn with me in your Bible today, we're going to read some scriptures. I'm going to pray, preach a little bit. And uh, so we, we ended a little early, and I'm so thankful f- uh, for, for Michael for being um, really just sensitive to the Holy Spirit and what the Lord's doing. Uh, we ended a little bit early today, so I've got a little extra time to preach. Is that what that means? I didn't know if that, okay, I didn't know that if that meant that, but uh, anyways, try to get you out of here at a good time. In Ephesians, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to be just focusing on one verse and then reading another chapter and, another, and just one verse in Colossians. But in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, I'm reading out of the um, New King James. Um, today. So in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 it says this, fathers, he's directly addressing fathers, fathers do not provoke your children to wrath or anger but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In Colossians chapter 3 if you turn there or click there you'll see that um, he again is teaching this church and writing in his letter to this church about families. And towards the end of this letter of chapter 3 he, he seems to be addressing um, our relationship with Christ, and then he goes into family relationships. And he says this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. Again, fathers, addressing them directly, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Don't provoke your children to wrath lest they become discouraged. In Ephesians chapter 5 and 6, Paul's teachings on the church and on marriage relationships and children in that order. And he begins to establish really what the Lord has had all along and the design of family. And as you know, in our church, we love families and we celebrate marriage and we celebrate families. And uh, so today I just want to talk a little bit about um, on the subject of provoking fathers, provoking fathers. Amen. Father, we just thank you for your word. It brings life. It's like medicine to our hearts, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that it's a treasure also, that when we open your word, we find that there are just nuggets of truth that we can live by, that we can, we can uh, Lord, plan our lives by these things. We can schedule our future according to your word because, Lord, your word is truth and it is life. I pray that that life and that truth is spoken today and resonates in our hearts as we leave, that we'll be encouraged in our faith and in our family. In Jesus' name, and everybody. He said, Amen. Amen. A few weeks ago, I had talked about this. I mentioned it. And then, of course, in the spring, we had talked about the subject of fatherless homes. And the issue really that is in front of us as a nation and kind of one, one of the major issues that are there uh, in our society is fatherless homes. America still leads the way in single parent homes uh, as far as the, the uh, average and, and numbers and, and in society and the rest of the world. So we know that that still is an issue. But some of you know have seen these statistics online. Uh, these Christian statistics that have been done over time and studied, uh, they say this, that if a child gets saved, that there's a 3% chance that his family will get saved, the rest of his family gets saved. How many have seen these statistics? And that if the wife gets saved first, that there's a 17% chance that the rest of the family will come to the Lord. But if the husband gets saved first, there's a 93% chance that the rest of the family will get saved. How many of you know fathers play a powerful role in our lives and society and in the kingdom of God? 
And so we, we know that we want to see father-filled homes. That's our heart. But, you know, uh, they, they say, and statistically speaking, that homelessness and suicide and behavioral issues really can be a result many times as a fatherless home. Is that right? And so we see that as a society. But I wanted to make a statement because um, I wanted to be clear on this, and I want to make a statement a little bit and just kind of throw this out there as uh, your pastor, but also, um, you know, as a Christian, I want to make this statement about fatherless homes. This is what, what, what I'm not saying, okay? When I talk about fatherless homes and fathers' homes, this is what I'm not saying. I, I'm, I'm not saying that just because you had a father in your home that it was good. How many know there's a lot of fathers in the home, but there's neglect, there's abuse, and there's even children who are spoiled, which can be almost as bad. So I'm not saying that, uh, you know, just because you have a father in the home that it's, it's always been good. Um, but I'm also not saying that you're a failure. If you grew up in a father's home or have a, uh, live in a home without a father even now, we're not saying that you're a failure or that you're abnormal and there's no hope and you'll never be accepted or loved by God. How many know that's not what we're saying? Amen. So a lot of people feel hopeless when we talk about this. Well, I don't ha- uh, look, I'm not growing up right now in a, in a father-filled home, or I haven't grown up in the past in a father-filled home. But how many know there's no condemnation in Christ? Amen. But this is what is true about um, what we're saying today, is that God's design and standard for family is good and it's blessed. How many know that, how many know that God's design for family is good? Yeah. Can somebody say amen to that, please? And blessed. It's blessed, right? So yes, it is. And children were created to be parented by a dad and a mom, a male and a female. They were a parent, a Children are created by God to be taught by parents, not society. Amen? That's God's design. And this is what is true. And that is this, that there is uh, indisputable negative fruit of fatherlessness in all cultures. Not just in America, but all cultures. There is negative fruit and repercussions of that. And also, um, what is true is that the role of a father, as designed by God in the Word of God, works, period. It just works. The way that God set things up, how do you know it just works? We're not doing it because we're following some kind of Christian creed that was created several hundred years ago, but what was designed thousands of years ago by God himself, amen, works. We believe that. And then fifthly, this is what's true. Family will always be greater than village. Amen. I believe that things are necessary and they're good, but how many know family was always greater than community and village? Amen. Because, as we see in, in our society, and I'm sad to say this, that even, and I quote uh, someone, that, uh, a famous uh, psychologist, family psychologist, that even the village is broken now. Even, even we can't even find good, solid community sometimes for our children to grow up in. Amen. And so I know that family is greater than anything else to raise children in. Amen. As a family. So whether that's a single parent home, whether that's a father filled home or a, a mom and dad home, how many know family is greater? Amen. And so what we can do as a church, what we can do as River Valley Church and also as Christians is that we can live out and promote principles of strong family. We We can work with men and teens. We can empower single parents. We can help others in need. Come on, in our community. We can live out what God has spoken in His Word. We can be light in darkness. And we can teach God's Word concerning families. Amen. So how many know families are important? Amen. Let's get back to Ephesians chapter 4. I have a lot to share today. My heart is overwhelmed by this scripture. It just is a lot to it. So I'm going to share this today. When he addresses the fathers, he's really addressing, as he says in Ephesians, the head of the the wife, the head of the, we could say the head of the house. We say that Paul doesn't say head of the house, but he says that Christ is the head of uh, the husband and that the husband is head of the wife or over the home. And together they raise a family. And so um, let me just say this, is that many people describe a family as a husband and wife get married and then they have kids and then they have a family. How many know a family is the husband and wife unit? 
that's where it starts. Kids are just that extension of that of family. So, um, so that's what we see in Scripture and also believe. Um, and so when he talks about that, he's talking about the authority figure, where it, it really kind of begins and ends. And it, kind of he's talking to this authority figure or the, the household here, father. So um, he starts with them, and he's really speaking to the whole house, but he's talking to uh, the fathers. And so uh, let me just throw this out, that the first step, in getting your house in order is getting yourself in order. How many believe that? So there's a lot of houses that are out of order and you can go back to where the father's out of order. All right. So in order to have your house in order, fathers, is, and I believe Paul is, is really kind of going in this direction. In order to have your house in order, you've got to put yourself in order. Get yourself in the order of God. Well, I don't take, I don't listen to anybody. I don't take, uh, you know, anything from anybody. I don't, I don't need to know about God. I don't need to go to church. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm good on my own. I can just lead people. How many know you've got to get an order? All right. You've got to follow up and line up with God's order. Let's talk about this word that he uses, provoke not your children. Ephesians chapter six, verse four, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, wrath, bring them up in the nurture, admonition of the Lord. Let's just break this down for a second. I just want to read um, a couple um, uh, other translations, but also a description of what he's talking about, provoking your children to anger. Do not irritate your children. Do not exasperate them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive, nor by showing favoritism or indifference to any of your children. Don't keep on scolding and nagging your children, making them angry and resentful. Provoke not your children to the wrath. That's what that means. And in Colossians chapter 3, when he repeats himself and he says it to this church, he says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. He says this, fathers, do not, don't scold your children so much that they become discouraged and quit trying. Do not be hard on them or harass them lest they become discouraged and feel inferior and frustrated. Do not break their spirit. I want you to just, if you're in Colossians chapter 3, if you want to go there, but just quickly, it's very interesting as he's breaking this down, talking about this and talking about the family and the order and everything like that. He, in the last two verses, I want to read the last two verses, very important, the last two verses. It's important to note this. In verse 24, he says, knowing, again, he's talking about family. Then he says this, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for the, you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. There is no partiality. So in other words, there is, there is reward for, for obeying what God said. There is a reward in the inheritance and the plan of God. But there is also, amen, uh, an accountability factor that he's talking about here. That you will give an account of how you treat your children. That if you, if, you, if you follow God's plan and his teachings, you'll receive a reward of the inheritance, the Bible says. But also, you will re be repaid for what you've done. There's no partiality. In other words, God's going to bring a blessing uh, or, or a, 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 a kind of almost, we could say, like almost a punishment if we do what we do, right? So how many know this is important? Paul's saying this isn't just something I'm speaking off the top of my head. I'm, I'm letting you know this is vitally important. How many believe that? Anybody? All right. So maybe you're not uh, used to my preaching. I can, I can get into fifth gear real quick with my preaching. and I've got to slow down. But um, provoke means this. This simply means this. It means provide the need needed stimulus for something. So it's you provide the needed stimulus for feelings or desires or activity. You provide the needed stimulus or motivation. Uh, and then that, it again, is in both positive and negative but in this sense, he starts out with, do not provoke your children to anger. So in a negative way, do not um, provide the stimulus of anger in your children. This is a negative form. It means to stir up, to arouse, to call them forth. Again, to, to uh, call them to something, to a feeling or an action. Uh, and, and he says this, and he, and he uses the two words this way. I'm going to focus on a couple words here. He uses the two words um, that the, re, the result of children or, or the uh, response that children have. Number, number one, he says anger and discouragement. So angry and discouraged. So children can become angry and discouraged. That's what he's saying, right? When provoked in a negative way. So to become angry. Now, now I I'm, I'm just want to say this. That doesn't mean that your kids aren't going to be upset with you or frustrated like why can't we have junk cereal donuts and chocolate for breakfast 
okay? You can't do that. They're going to be angry about that, right? You can't watch t- TV for 20 hours a, a day. They're, maybe, and they might be discouraged. You might tell them, hey, we, we're going to go to the zoo, but we're not doing that today. We're going to actually scrub the floors, right? So they can become discouraged. How many know? Now, this is what he's talking about. He's not talking about everyday little instructions like that. He's giving you, saying, in their life, in their character, in their heart. He's saying that at the larger picture, in the long term, children can become angry and discouraged by the way you uh, present yourself or teach or the way that you lead them, right? So it's not just like, well, let's see, what's, what, what's, not gonna, what's gonna make my kids happy? Oh yeah, cereal and donuts, let's make them. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's saying in a larger picture and of a greater scale, What's going to cause something in their, in their um, heart and in their character to become angry and discouraged? Think about it, right? So to be angry, to, uh, to be enraged or infuriate them or aggravate them or instigate. In other words, you're instigating something in them. You're, they're frustrated. It means to, 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 that word ex, ex, exasperate means to wear down when, when they're just being wore down. They're discouraged. How many know discouragement brings hopelessness? Parents can bring, actually speak hopelessness into their children. You can actually lead your children to a place of hopelessness. And you think you're doing a good job, but they're angry, they're discouraged. And so the idea is, uh, you know, why even try? Why even try to listen? Why try to be a good kid? Why try to behave myself when all I'm going to get is is anger and I'm provoked to be angry. Think about it. You know, I might as well be rebellious because all that's all I can get that response of my parents. That's all I hear from them. All right? So they get discouraged. That's what that word means. So don't frustrate or discourage your children. He also uses the two words, don't do this, but do this. He says, don't um, provoke them to anger or discouragement. But he said what? Raise them up and nurture and admonition of the Lord. Seems like this mic's ringing a little bit. Anyways, nurture and admonition of the Lord. So in other words, don't do this, do this instead. How many know there's an alternative? So what he's saying, there's an alternative to this kind of parenting. And so that kind of parenting uh, that provokes the anger is a reactionary. It's this emotional reaction that you have and then your children have. But then he says, he, he really says this nurture and admonition is more of a response. It's more of a physical response with, with meekness and self-control. It's firm, but it's loving. It's firm, but it's loving. This is what he's saying. So it's not this reactionary, emotional reaction, but this physical response is what he's saying. So treat your children in such a way that they want to obey. Again, let's leave candy out of the picture, right? How many know? It's not talking about giving candy for everything, like like a dog. You would just give them a treat for everything. How many know kids don't need to be, you know, have a treat for everything? Amen. They just need to obey. But this is not what he's saying. So, and, and so not to be unreasonably severe or with impractical demands on your children. Wow. How many know a parent should never expect their children to do what they are not willing to do themselves? Well, you better listen to my authority. You better respect my authority. And you don't respect the authority of police officers, of government officials, or of other parents. Amen. How many know? So you're teaching your children one way or the other. But a parent should train their children the same way God teaches us. The same way that God teaches his children. That's the way what Paul is saying here. It's not according to society or culture, but it's the kingdom culture. It's the kingdom way. And that is the way that God disciplines and teaches us. How many know that the Lord lovingly disciplines us? And how many know he lovingly guides us and teaches us? Amen. But you know, I, I want to just throw this out, especially to parents today, and just understand this, especially um, for preteens and teens, is that there is so much pressure on your children in culture. There is already pressure uh, on your child in a family. If they have one or more siblings, there's pressure there. There's that burden they carry. Did you know that kids today are carrying a burden of culture more at a younger and younger age? The appearance, the, uh, I've got a, how many know, as a parent, you can check out at 30 with the new, latest music. In fact, at 40 years old, you can get one hairstyle and stay with it for the next 40 years. And you're cool, and it's okay. It's all right, right? 
kids don't have that. They have the burden of culture. They've got to keep up with the styles and the appearance and the music and the friends and my future and, and what do I look like and what do I sound like. And how many know, kid, that's all, that burden is on your children. You don't want to put a burden on your children and oppression on your children at home. Your home should be a, a, a kind of a, a, a safe haven, or it should be a safe zone, not a war zone. You should be able to create in your children the standard of life that comes from your home, not culture. How many know can say amen? So the standard of living for a Christian does not call, come from culture, but it comes from the home. But if it's not coming from the home, the only thing they have is culture. That's the music, the, what they see on the videos and, their, uh, and the a- athletes that they... Come on. How many know you, you, can, uh, uh, you can know what a kid's uh, style of music is or who he likes and, and who they follow just by what the clothes they wear? Amen? So that pressure is on teenagers or young kids. That's on them already. Do not put this added pressure in their life provoking them to anger. So what does provoked anger look like? Let me go through this quickly. As one translation says, it crushes their spirit. When you provoke a child to anger, you crush their spirit. You break something in them. Something in them becomes broken. You crush their spirit. Now there's a difference in parenting between bending their will and breaking their spirit. You do not want to break a child's spirit. How many know you remember you're sitting in this room and you can think of this moment when your father said something to you that broke your spirit. Your mother said something to you that crushed your spirit. Anybody? Come on. How many know that's not the way our father God treats us? How many know that? He doesn't say things, but he says things to bend your will. The word of God is all about conforming your will to his. And so he's going to say some things that aren't comfortable to you, but he's not going to break your spirit. When you go through something, I'm just going to add this and throw this out. When you go through a trial and you go through a circumstance, God's goal is not to break your spirit, to crush your spirit and break your heart. It's that your heart gets stronger. Your spirit gets stronger. Amen. Come on. Amen. Though, even though, as Paul said, my weakness, in my weakness, he's made strong. Amen. All right. We got to go on. And it simply means destroying hope. That's what it means to provoke them to anger. You destroy hope in your child. You extinguish love and what true love looks like. That's why you'll have kids at younger and younger age searching for love online because they can't find it at home. You extinguish love. You put a burden and oppression on them. There's this oppression that comes in your house and this heaviness that's in your relationship where they don't feel they can trust you or talk to you. They can't open up to you because you've provoked them to anger. You know, come on. And, and you suppress them. You, it, it's teaching them to react under restraint. So they're now reacting because of this anger. They're reacting because of this discouragement. And every decision they make in life and what they see in the world is through this lens of discouragement. Think about it. So what it means to provoke your child to anger is that your, their potential is silenced. So that doesn't mean that it's killed, it's just silenced in your home. You, they don't feel that they can come to the potential. You're not trying to cultivate potential. You're, you're actually hindering them. You're holding them back in potential in who they could really be. Think about it. Amen. So when you provoke to anger, you're neutralizing, you're preventing. Um, and, and it also, this p- potential is uh, when it is, is kind of held back and neutralized, what happens is there's a resisting that happens. Whether it's in their heart or physically, they begin to resist you. And then rebellion ha- happens. And they begin to rebel against you and authority and everything that represents authority. And everything that represents a dad and everything that represents a mom. Everything that represents structure and family and everything. They begin to resist it. And then they begin to create something different that really isn't healthy. Think about it. But what does he say? All right, so provoke not to wrath. But what does he say? But, I love that, but raise them up. <laughs> I mean, no, our job as parents are to raise up our children. We're raising them up. We're raising them up. How many believe that? That's what it is. But raise them up. In other words, there's an alternative. Raise them up. Raise them up. I feel like as a father, you need to have that, I want to raise up my children. Just like uh, I believe this picture would be in two things, like a building, you're building, but also like a garden, you're raising these kids up. You're, ra- you're nurturing, you're taking the time, you're raising them up. These translations say this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Raise them up with loving discipline and counsel that brings the revelation of our Lord. 
the loving discipline the Lord himself approves of with suggestions and godly advice, tenderly with loving kindness. How many know when he says tenderly with loving kindness, this isn't weakness? Many people think, well, I just need to be a weak parent because the Bible says I need to be kind and I need to be loving. That's not weakness. Amen? And a father doesn't have abuse. He doesn't bring abuse into their life or this hardness into their life. He brings firmness and steadiness. And he brings this, this meekness. Come on, somebody. Meekness is what? Power under control. That's what meekness is. And so it's not weakness, it's meekness. And did you know in the Bible there's over 25 verses that specifically talk about teaching your children? You teach them, talk to them about what God did. I mean, I believe it's in Exodus. It says after they came out of the promise or out of the uh, Egypt and came out of bondage, it says, here's what's important for you, parents. You need to tell your parents or your children exactly what happened. Tell them about, amen, the lamb that was slain and the blood that was put over the four po- or the doorpost of their house. Tell them about the plagues of Egypt. Tell them about we suffered a long time, but God raised up a deliverer. Tell them that, listen, e- uh, Pharaoh got up set. He let us go, but then he started chasing us down, and we stood there in front of the Red Sea, but God opened the Red Sea, and then we got on the other side, and the whole Egyptian army was was drowned, and all we got now is promised land. I mean, it was neat. It was exciting. Listen, we had bread. We had bread from heaven. We had quail that we had so much of, we were getting sick of it. I mean, talk about what God has done. Amen? He says, talk about what the Lord's done. Talk about it. But also, you teach them the principles of God. Let's look at these two words quickly. Nurture. Nurture means to discipline. It says tutoring. It's education or training. This type of education. There's a learning that comes through this disciplinary correction. It even uses the word chastening. Uh, Instruction. It means to train up a child in the way it should go, as Proverbs says. This is discipline. This loving discipline. Now, some of you just got triggered. Because I said the D word, discipline. And, and listen, to the level that you understand God is a level of you understand this word. And the level you understand and or measure things from your past or from culture is how you react to this word, discipline. It's, that's what it means, nurturing, the discipline. The in, and then the it, it, admonition means the instruction. This is calling attention to. This is even con- considered a mild rebuke or warning or preventive parenting. This is, we're teaching our kids, hey, listen, we don't touch the hot stove because you'll get burned. How many know that's, that's good to learn? So you're giving them instruction, calling attention to something. And also it means the intellect or the mind. And so we're teaching our kids how to think about things, how to feel about things, and also our, their will, what, what they should be focusing on in life, and how to deal with your anger and all those things. So that this is the intellect. This is this instruction. It also has a word in there that is theo, which does mean God in the Greek. But in the Hebrew, it means foundation or to settle, to establish. This is where we get the word theology. The theology of God or the teachings of God or the things that are essential about God. Right? So this is, what, this is the instruction we give our children to reverence and serve God and to walk in His principles. This is what we're teaching our children. Let me just throw a couple things out. I believe it's important that fathers show consideration for the different levels of understanding and experience that their children possess. All right? So you have to adapt and, and understand your children. The different uh, you're, you're kind of teaching them at their level and, and risk causing these headaches down the road would be, would be easy to say, well, I just told everybody the same thing and then I'm good. No? How many know there's each child you've got to teach them at the level they're at? Amen. How many know you teach a 12-year-old one thing and you teach an 8-year-old another? All right? But we're all teaching them to, to listen, aren't we? But there's just those different levels. And the second thing is, is that we should train up a child or train your children, instruct your children, talk to your children when they're young. Don't wait for things to get out of hand. Don't wait till they get older and then say, well, I'll wait till they get to be a teen to talk about that. I'm going to tell you right now, it's way too late to talk about important things. Uh, sir, come on. And then don't wait. Don't, don't take care of things immediately. Talk about things right away as soon as they're ready. And the third thing I just want to throw out there is that feeling anger and frustration as a parent, come on, and stress levels of parents is normal. <laughs> So I'm not saying it's abnormal to be angry. I'm not saying it's abnormal, but don't provoke your children to anger. Don't allow your frustration, your anger, to cause them to be angry and discouraged. 
I mean, you know, you get angry and you get frustrated. I don't know what your, what your plan is as a parent, whether you walk out of the room, count to 10, whatever, get the stress balls going, whatever you do, I don't know what it is, but how many know we are frustrated? You get, I mean, if, if you've got even more than one child, I mean, one child can get you, you know, frustrated. But I mean, just for us traveling, we went twice across the country with our kids and, and they were at a younger age and just going into the drive through will just drive you crazy. Like, I'm about ready to get an Uber and go myself. All right? Like, everybody out. I mean, you know what I mean? You just get frustrated. You get angry. You go, like this. Really? I know. How many, how many have children that, that are young, but they know how to push your buttons? Like, there's this, this, this talent that they have. And there's a skill level that they're at where they just know at a certain time of the day, at a, a certain phrase, or when you just had enough at work and you come home and they're like, yes, you're primed and ready for the butt, right? I believe that that is a talent that all children possess is button pushing. Amen. But it's normal. But here's what God teaches us, that we take these normal uh, actions or these normal feelings and we work patience in there. We work gentleness in with it and we, work, we walk in meekness. Amen. And so let's just go through this quickly. That without nurturing and without admonition or without the discipline and instruction as the Bible teaches us, which I want to spend some time on in the future on what the Bible says about disciplining children. But discipline and instruction, without these things, this is what you'll get. You'll get overcorrection, which leads to control issues and abuse, right? Or you'll have child-centered parenting where it's all about how they feel. Do you want to listen to me today? How do you feel about that? Do you, do you, do you, want, to, do you want to go to school ever? How do you feel about that? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, go- I'm going to quit my good job so that because my, my child wants me to so that I can like stay home and not make any money and so that I can provide for that and I can feed them in bed and they can watch Netflix all day. And I, I, how many know that just it doesn't work? And yet we got a whole generation that child-centered parenting is messing us up. Let me give you an example of something. Talk about a story quickly. Amen. And we need to move along. And that is in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22, 25. I've actually gone over my time. And um, it is a son or a, a guy by the name of Eli. All right. A guy by the name of Eli who had two sons. He was a priest, ministered before the Lord. And his two sons actually grew up and they became priests and they ministered in the tabernacle. Okay. So we won't turn there, but this is what it is. And so um, really, so as they got older, the Bible says that they actually started really sinning and doing some, some serious uh, violations and, and doing some bad things. Uh, one of them was flirting and, and sleeping with the women in, in the tabernacle that came and, and actually it just was messed up. And, and all of a sudden, the Bible says that Eli found out about what sons is doing by other people because he was never directly involved in their life. And then he tried to correct them, but it was way too late. They were already older. He already allowed it to happen. And, and, and then he was like, you guys can't do this. And he's like, I don't think so. We've been doing it for a while, and you didn't say anything. So this was a problem. And so we, we, the Bible also records how it came to that point. How do you get two sons that are so out of control, that are so obnoxious, and actually are sinning before the Lord and thinking that it's okay, and are broken and dysfunctional, how, do you th- how does that come to that point? Well, the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 29, it says that Eli honored his sons above the Lord. He allowed them to do what they wanted to do, when they wanted to do it, how they felt. He honored his sons above the Lord. They probably didn't even qualify for the priesthood. He just snuck them in there because they were his sons. Think about it. And then it says this in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13. He did not restrain them. He never told them no. He never told them it was wrong. He never gave them instruction. There was absolutely no discipline in their life whatsoever. No discipline, no instruction. And now you got a mess on your hands. And guess what happened? The Bible says that the ark was stolen by the Philistines. The ark of the covenant. The presence of the Lord. The Lord allowed the army to come in. Take the ark of the covenant. Which before, that would never have happened. And then what else? The Bible says the glory of God departed from the nation of Israel. The whole nation lost the glory because of this. And then his sons died with the ark. 
They died in their calling. They didn't fulfill what God called them to do. They didn't do it the right way. They actually died. The Lord allowed them to die in a shameful manner. And then the Bible says Eli himself died, fell off the, I believe it was the back of a balcony or a chair, and broke his neck and died. That his priestly authority was severed in Israel. Think about it. How many know we've got to have the biblical view of what the Bible says about our children? We don't provoke our children in one way or the other. And lastly, provoking them isn't all that bad. I, I, thank you for bearing with me today. Provoking isn't all that bad, right? Because it means that we need the stimulus for provoking. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is talking to the church. He's talking about the, the awesome uh, privilege we have of being in the body of Christ. He's talking about how awesome it is we gather together as saints. And then he says this, provoke one another to love and good works. In other words, we motivate one another to love and good works. And so when we raise our children in the nurture and admission of the Lord, we provoke them or motivate them to reverence God, to do His Word, to love God first and love other people better than themselves. How many know we provoke our children to love and good works? So here's what it looks like when you provoke your children to love. You bring aid. That word aid and succor is the same word that is used in the beginning with Adam and Eve when the Bible says that, that God brought Eve to Adam to be a help me. That's the same word, aid, to assist, to support them, to build them up, to encourage them, to compliment. This isn't to fluff them up or puff them up or give them false hope or flattery or uh, feed them arrogance or pride. Like, you're so amazing, nobody should ever argue with you. You know, just that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about build them up in the right areas, encourage them in the things that are good. We applaud our children to approve uh, and bring approval into their lives. It brings a calmness and a comfort to them, a reassurance to their heart. There's a security that comes to children when we provoke them to love and good works in the right way. Uh, and, and, and I believe that, let me just throw this out to give you a remedy today in closing to make a short sermon even longer, um, is to encourage responsibility in your children. Support appropriately. Amen? Support appropriately. We support them appropriately. We communicate effectively. We don't speak for them. We don't talk at them. We bring remedies and we create solutions. We communicate effectively. We pro provoke uh, your children to hard work, to learning, to serving others. Provoke them to teach and, and teach them about love and relationships and money and moderation and life itself. Amen? How many know that we're called to teach our children the ways of the Lord and not provoke them to anger? How many believe that today? How many have been challenged as fathers? I've been a little challenged today, amen, to really, amen, think about things differently or maybe approach my children a little bit different, amen? Amen, amen. good. Let's stand on our feet today. Amen. amen. So Ephesians, amen. But Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, I'm going to read that again. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There's one thing I know today, and I want to close by praying for the fathers, because I, want, I know that there's, there's so much going on in your life, right? Some of you are just, you have multiple jobs. You have a long job, a tiresome job. I know that you're, um, some of you are just trying, and, and maybe you've actually had to... Um, kind of you've fallen a little bit and you've fallen even in society and you're working your way back and you're getting to the place and maybe you've lost some things in life. Maybe you went through uh, maybe a, a broken relationship that you've lost some things out of that and um, gotten married again and had new families and you're trying to build relationships and there's so many challenges that fathers have. But here's one thing I do know, one thing I do know is that God will give you the grace to be a good dad. God's grace is on your life to be a father. Amen? How many believe that? You believe that? Amen. God's grace is on your life. Amen. And let me just ask you this. When Paul was talking, because this is very interesting. Theologians and historians always, always bring out this point about Paul, right? And here's something amazing about Paul. Paul was never married. Paul didn't have children, natural children. He didn't have biological children. Amen. But the Bible says that he actually was a spiritual father, had spiritual children. Amen. So he talks about that. But where does Paul get his information? It's like, Paul, where do you get off, man? I mean, you, 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 you're an older guy, right? Older Jewish guy. You didn't have kids. You never got married. And yet you're teaching me and you're, you're trying to, I mean, this is for the whole church. I mean, this is like for the whole nation of Israel. Like you're telling us what marriage looks like, what a husband should do, what a wife should do. I mean, I mean, Paul, come on, where are you getting your 
information. Where are you getting this? And, and I can say that I, I can honestly see it in Paul's life that he's getting it from his heavenly father. He's getting it from his example. His greatest example is his heavenly father. Amen. Not only is he giving a revelation because the Bible says that men were moved on by the Holy Spirit and they wrote the things that they felt and heard from the Holy Spirit. But I, I believe that. But also he's getting all this information and teaching from the example he sees from his heavenly father. And so, fathers, I want to just encourage you today. I mean, we draw from good advice, from counsel. I mean, you've got great stuff today. There's so much good information about how to be a, a dad and have a good family the, these days. But our greatest example, our greatest resource is the Father God. Amen? The way he loves us, the way he disciplines us, the way he instructs us. I mean, he's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us so many resources. And so that's my example. And so let that be your example today as a father. That, Lord, you're my father and you're my example. Help me to reflect the way you teach me, the way you love me into my family. Amen. Father, we just thank you today. And we just thank you for your word, Lord, today that, Lord, it just brings life, it brings health, and, Lord, to all who hear it. We just pray that we would be doers of the word, not hearers only. That, Lord, we would see such a change in our home, such a change in our community, and such a change in our nation, Lord. That we would have successful father-filled homes, that we would have healthy father relationships, that we would have, amen, the things that the Bible says we can have, amen, about family, because we practice the word of God. I trust you, Lord, and I trust you your word today. I bless all your people and the families and the homes. I bless the children. I bless the teenagers. I bless, amen, the singles. I bless uh, grandparents today, aunts and uncles, Lord, as we work together. And I give you the praise and glory. And, and, and everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you today. If you need prayer today, we'd love to pray with you. Amen. But for the rest of us, amen, we pray that you would be blessed as you greet 10 or 12 people today. Amen. God bless you.